be uh, in prayer. I'm going uh, very soon. I'm going to uh, Ray McKillop's church. Their deliverance is broken out on a wide scale out there. And uh, they've asked me to come over and help them. And uh, last Sunday, I believe it was, they had a, a little girl in witchcraft that was, had run out the door and they had to drag her back in. And they were praying with her all day long. And she finally got enough deliverance so she got a hold of herself. And uh, also, I was talking to Brenda, and she said that to be start praying now, she's going to be on 100 Huntley Street, the Canadian 700 Club, sort of. And the audience that they reach is about, what did she tell me, 80% lost in that uh, Canadian sweep. <clears throat> and they come on, on Channel 38 here, too. But it's in February. She's scheduled to go on on this pornography thing, and she's done a lot of damage. As a matter of fact, Hugh Hefner came out fighting the last time she, she made an appearance. He was fighting back at her. But they wrote a report to the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography or something. And Brenda's testimony was written up. The man who compiled it was so impressed with her testimony about Jesus that it's in the front of the report. It heads the report. Uh, a testimony of Jesus, so she was just praising the Lord because there was, it was the only, she was the only one who said anything about the Lord, and hers was the one they printed to introduce the pornography report, the report on pornography and so forth. So, and um, uh, she's really stirred Mr. Hefner up because uh, she knows him. She was, <laughs> she was in his mess for a while. And she blows the lid off every time she goes on a program. She just came back from uh, out in Los Angeles. She'd been out there. And it's taking her here, there, and yonder to speak on the, on panel shows and so forth. And if you've ever heard Brenda, she's a real bulldog when she gets on there. They don't, they don't back her down at all. I saw her on Oprah's show here. <clears throat> they ran it a couple of times. And <laughs> they had this uh, porno movie queen on there. And she was tangling with her, and she didn't back Brenda down. Brenda just socked her right across the ears. And uh, she knew where she's coming from, and she, she let her have it. I, I said, no, get her, Brenda. Get her. Get her again. <laughs> and uh, so, just pray. They're watching me because sometimes I say, where are you going? I'm not through, but I won't do them that way this morning. I'm, I'm not, I don't do those things anymore. <laughs> a nasty chuckle if I ever heard one <laughs> let's turn in our Bibles please to Joshua chapter 6 the captain of the host has just shown up Jesus has appeared to Joshua and said he said who are you and he said I'm the captain of the host of the Lord you know, when, when there's a critical battle to go, the Lord Jesus always shows up. And now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel, chapter 6, verse 1. None went in, none went out. But what happened, they were scared to death. This was a walled city. And I wish I had time to go into the historical thing. It's unbelievable, the thickness of these walls. And they were, they were built up to withstand all kinds of sieges. And they had shut the gates and the walls, and the city was under siege, and they were terrified because a strange army of people had come. And when they crossed, crossed the river, we talked about last time, it caused flooding all the way up the Jordan because God just stopped the river. And all the floodwaters, it was at flood time, and the waters went out of their banks and flooded everything upstream before the children of Israel. Because his people had to go across dry shot, and it's too bad about the heathen. They got wet. Everything washed away. And um, this gives me great encouragement. I want to call your attention to it again. I think we talked about it Thursday night. And, uh, but it's great, greatly encouraging because God will change times and seasons and he'll, he'll lay it on the heathen to deliver his people. And that's kind of nice to know because I'll tell you one thing, the heathen got things going now. I was just reading last night about... Uh, the new gold coins that the Treasury Department is issuing, they're only releasing 15,000 of those to the Americans. Everything else, all the millions of dollars, goes overseas to the international bankers. Just another way to give our gold away, what little we got. And here we thought they were being nice. 
<laughs> to the international bankers, ray, to the American people, forget it. You drugs get back to work. And you're, by the way, you better brace yourself because your tax is definitely going to jump horribly in 87. They're going to have to get that money from someplace. They're not going to get it from the bankers. The bankers are getting it the other way. And we're heading straight into either a total economic collapse or revolution or both. Amen. You just might as well know about it. It's coming. And if you pray about it now and get yourself spirit, you say, how can I prepare? Well, there's not too much of a way you can prepare for an avalanche coming. But uh, if you prepare spiritually, you'll be on top of the thing. And do as wise as you can about material things. But I'll tell you this, the paper money, the T-bills and all the rest of the stuff is no good. That paper is no good. And they're working on legislation right now so that any transaction that's $500 or more will be reported directly to the IRS. And they already have it. You know, you can't write a $5,000 check, $5,000 or more, any kind of instrument, money order, cashier's check, or anything else. Uh, they have to file a paper with the IRS, and they'll be on your door saying, where'd you get that money? Is it yours? Can you prove it? Because, you know, in nowadays... Our country was founded on the idea that you're innocent until you prove guilty. But the IRS has reversed that. You're guilty and unless you can prove that you're innocent and it's almost impossible because they control all the rules. And if you happen to be winning, they change the rules. And that puts you behind the eight ball again. And they're talking about dropping that limit very soon to $3,000. I'll keep you informed. There's no use having them snooping in your business. It's none of their business. This nation was arranged so that people could mind their own business. And it was never intended that big government run your lives. It was never intended the government run the schools. They're talking about now, they're working on a deal now to federally certify all teachers and be sure they're humanistic or they won't let them teach. And they're moving to throw out all Christian teachings of all kinds. And they're already, in six months, they have doubled the postage rates for nonprofit corporations, religious ones. Now, the New Age people and all that, they still get breaks. Those pumping out occult garbage are doing fine. And I was just reading about recently, they had a, a big seminar for the executives of GM, AT&T, and another giant corporation. And they were teaching them, these, these top management people, they were teaching them uh, transcendental meditation, and the occult and other uh, occult techniques to make them better able to manage the economic picture. In other words, what we're talking about is they're turning everything over to witchcraft. Well, you know when the witches get in charge, you know what's going to happen to you and me, don't you? Now, are we going to take it lying down? See, God is letting these things come to pass because his people are ignoring his warning signals. And he says, if they won't listen, if they won't get the weapons of war, if they don't want to be in deliverance, okay, we'll wipe, let them wipe them out. We'll let them see what the consequences are. And he's given time and space for repentance. It has not come on a broad enough basis yet. But I'm still persuaded that for those who will follow God's plan, they're still going to have a, a, a special place in God's economy. Oh, we may be martyred. They may kill us. Well, what's wrong with that? You get a martyr's crown when you get to heaven. How about that? God said, I have a surprise for you. You got killed for Jesus' sake. Guess what? You have a special place. You say, well, that doesn't sound too promising. It's a lot more promising than what's coming. If the devil gets loose down here anymore. But I'm not through yet. Are you? You know, I walked around here more dead than alive for many, many months. And here about, now it's been about three months ago, my health took a radical, not just a gradual, but a radical turn for the better, and I feel great. <laughs> and that means that, see, I'm a good friend and I'm a deadly enemy, and I have some very deadly enemies I'm going to work on. And I kept telling the Lord, you've got to give me more health if you want me to keep on the trail. I'm, going to have to, I'm just going to have to fold my tent and quit. I can't drag any further. I've drug over 250,000 miles with half dead, and I just can't go any further. I'm just to the place you're going to have to do something. And he did. He's answered the prayers of hundreds of people. Lord of mercy. You know, I ought to do better than I'm doing. I've got people praying for me all the way from Indonesia to, to Germany, all around the world in between. The people praying for this 
Win Worley. Some of them never even seen me. And uh, they, they have the books or the tapes, and they're praying for me. I have people in Africa praying for me. They write and say, we're praying for you, brother. And uh, this tells me the work's not done yet. Don't be so relieved. Some of you young buckos are going to have to, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm setting it up now where I can slip out. Then I'm going to watch from the balcony, cheer you on. <laughs> Except I haven't had much success with that so far. Most of the time I end up out on the, I'm plowing the front lines again. But that's all right. I told the Lord a long time ago, I said, Lord, if you give me health and strength, I'm not going to be out on the golf course, and I'm not going to be running around recreating and vacating. Uh, I'll be, whatever you give me, I'm going to use for the battle. And the strength has been pouring into me at a frightening rate. Well, that tells me that we're ready for another major push against the enemy. (laughs) Praise the Lord. So if you're feeling draggy, I've been there. It's better on this other side, I'll tell you that. And the witchcraft is increasing against this church phenomenally. I continue to see angels around me from time to time, periodically. And I know that the attacks have stepped up because the protection has stepped up. And ever since the trip, the last trip we made to Australia and Indonesia, when the witches were mobilized to knock the airplane out from here to, from here to Sydney, Australia, and, they, of course, as you can see, they didn't succeed. They didn't even shake it very much. But uh, I've been occasionally seeing angels around me from time to time. Now that I know what they are, it didn't bother me. When I first saw them, I rebuked them. I thought maybe the demons were trying to play games. I said, I'm, I'm too tired to fool with you. Just go away in Jesus' name. They didn't go away. <laughs> And then it gradually emerged that that was really the Lord's angels escorting. And so it's kind of a nice feeling to once in a while see a little ring of fire going around, you know. And I think, oh, hello, hello again, yes. Usually when I drive out on the expressway, I see them. (laughs) So uh, don't be like Rob. He said, well, we were on the airplane. I said, well, our friends are back again when we're starting to land. He said, well, ask, uh, get me some. I said, get your own. <laughs> I mean, as big as I am, it takes all I can get just to surround me, you see. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I believe we're going to see more and more of God's power moving. And so if you're getting hit, it's witchcraft curses. Break those witchcraft curses daily against you and your family, against your finances, against your health. It seems like finances and health are being hit hard. Break those curses and fling them right back on the ones that are sending them. Now, I know that doesn't seem loving, but it's not very loving for them to send them either. I mean, if you get a package addressed to you and you didn't order it, you are perfectly entitled to say, return to sender. I didn't order this. If they send me junk that I don't want, I return it to the sender. And I advise you to do the same thing, according to Psalm 109. Now, the witches don't like that. But uh, I do, because it works. And when they get a few packages dumped in their laps, blowing up in their face, they'll, they'll quit their foolishness. <clears throat> and if they don't, they deserve what they're going to get. All right, Jerusalem, uh, Jericho, was locked up tight in terror. Remember, Rahab had told them that they had heard what this God had done. And the God had sent his fear before the people to terrorize them. And God said to Joshua, verse 2, See, I have given in thy hand Jericho and the king thereof, the mighty man of Errol. He said, I have already given you the city, the king, and his whole army. Well, that's a stupid thing. You're sitting out there and here's a walled city, one of the strongest cities in all of the land. It's a funny thing, God picked the biggest, strongest city to hit first. And you know, if God can overcome the biggest, strongest stronghold, then he can always hit the littler ones, wouldn't you think? Littler, I don't think, is a word. Smaller. I did go to school once. Um, And ye shall compass or circle the city, all ye men of war, and go around the city once. This thou shalt do six days. Well, now, that's a silly way to... 
I mean, I'm not even an army man, and I know that you don't win war. It's just putting your men and marching around the city in a line. I mean, what good does that do? And that's what he told him to do. March him around six days. And the seven, pri- seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. The seventh day you will circle the city seven times, and the priests will blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now that was a pretty big order because that wall was thick, and it was built like this from the back and flat on the front to keep from climbing up, and then it was built like this to keep it from being able to be pushed over. God said it's going to fall flat. And the way it fell, it fell out. And you'd expect if it was going to fall, it'd fall in, but it didn't. It fell out. And the archaeologists used to just laugh at the Bible account of that. Then they dug up the ruins. And they said, guess what? Those walls did fall out flat. <clears throat> well, God never has been proven wrong yet. Man has been proved wrong every year, sometimes every month. And he said, the people will make a great shout and ascend every man straight before them. They're going to have the place surrounded. And then everybody, when they shout, the trumpets blow, they're going to move right straight forward toward the city. And Joshua called the priests then, said, take up the Ark of the Covenant. Let seven priests bear the trumpets of the ram's horns and so forth. He tells them what they're to do. And it came to pass, verse 8, when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns, passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets. The Ark of the Covenant did follow them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew the trumpet, and rearward came after the Ark. In other words, the army was before and after the Ark. The Ark was in the middle. That's a good place to have Jesus right in the middle of the army, isn't it? And um, the priests going on blowing the trumpets. And Joshua commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then you shall shout. Can you imagine having to be quiet for seven days? Some of you look, I don't think so. He said, don't you? Some of you husbands think, oh, wouldn't that be great? (laughs) You know, preachers sometimes make a nasty joke about there not going to be any women in heaven. And they use the scripture in Revelation because there was silence for the space of 30 minutes or something like that, or an hour and a half. I wouldn't do that myself. (laughs) But this is going to be hard on everybody. Everybody has to be quiet. Nobody can say a word for all the time this is going on. And um, so the ark of the Lord compassed the city going about it once, and they came back in the camp and lodged in the camp. Now, the... (laughs) Can you imagine the people in Jericho? They see this army, two and a half, three million people out there with all their livestock. And here's their soldiers, men of war with shields and spears and bows and arrows and things. And here they're forming. They thought, oh, Lord, they're fixing to come. Here they come. Ooh, look at that. That army's coming. And there's that funny box in the middle. Those priests are out there. Ooh, that's the one we heard about that stopped the river. That gold box they're carrying over there. And then... uh, and then the army was behind them, and they're marching in a circle. They said, oh, boy, get braced. Oh, boy, this is it. Everybody pray to our gods quick for protection because they're going to charge surely. They marched around the city, and it was absolutely quiet, no noise. Then they went back and broke camp, started fixing, fixing their meals. And people of Jericho said, what on earth is going on? The soldier said, well, these people are not that bad. I thought, sure, well, they'll probably do it tomorrow. This is a trick. And every day for seven days they did this. For six days they marched around. Then they'd go back to camp. And and the camp was so quiet there wasn't anything going. They said, are those people dead over there? You don't hear anything over there. Just silence. And uh, now on the... On the seventh day, verse 15. Now, by the way, you can imagine what happened in Jericho. The second day they were scared. They thought, boy, they'll do it today. 
They thought, well, tomorrow for sure, the third day, they're going to charge. But then the next time they said, well, these people don't know how to fight. They're just going to march around out there and wear a hole in the, in the ground out there, marching in a circle outside the wall out there. Well, these people are not bad. We just we must have heard wrong rumors. Pretty soon it got to be a, everybody was trying to get a place on top of the wall where they could watch these dummies go by, you know, and the popcorn, peanuts, uh, See the, see the dumb Israelites march. Uh, if you want to seat on the front row of the wall to watch them go around. They said, well, it's kind of dumb. Look at them. Hey, you going to attack today? What's the matter out there? Hey, you. Are you a soldier? What you going to do? Soldiers marching on, didn't say a word. Just march, march, march. Well, they got to be pretty hilarious, you know. And they thought, well, these people, we're, they're no problem. Just let them march around out there. They're dropping their tracks. We don't care. They're not, we hadn't, they hadn't shot an arrow. They hadn't charged. They hadn't hollered. They hadn't done nothing. And we thought these folks were so bad. But now notice, on the, fifth, on the sixth, seventh day, they rose early about the dawning of the day. Oh, what a dreadful time to get up. And um, they circled the city about the same manner, seven times only on that day. They compassed the city seven times. They circled it seven times. It came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew on the trumpets. Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now, boy, they had been buttoned up for, yea, these six whole days. And I can imagine they let her rip when it came out. They shouted. He said, the Lord and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. To the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are in her house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. Now remember, her house is on the wall. It's got that red string dangling out of the wall, that red ribbon hanging out the window. And that's the only part of the wall that stood. The rest of the wall fell. And her house was the only thing spared. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from any cursed thing, lest you make yourself a curse. And when you take the cursed thing and make the help of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver, gold, vessels of brass and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They'll come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. It came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout, the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city. The wall fell out and then the people just came right up over the wall, the fallen wall, and right into the city. The city was completely open. And uh, they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. Man and woman, young and old, the ox, sheep, and the ass with the edge of the sword. They slaughtered everybody in that city. That was the orders. And we've got some real sweet people walking around today that say God never does do dreadful things anymore. I got news for you. He's going to do some dreadful things before this is over. He has done it before. This place was cursed by God. They were full of abominations and witchcraft, and God hates this. And the judgment of God comes, and it's rough when it falls. And their iniquity cup was full, and just like he fell on Egypt and wiped them out and blotted them out with, with plagues and with horrible death curses all over them, Jericho suffered the same fate. And if you think that God is easy on witchcraft, you just take a look at what he orders here. He ordered men and women, young and old, babies and all, even the livestock had been hexed to make them produce. And they were all polluted as far as God was concerned. He wanted none of that witchcraft mess to be around his people, and he ordered it completely destroyed. And Joshua said to the two men that spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman, all she has, as you swear unto her. And by the way, the story of Rahab is a, such an encouraging thing. She was a woman who had lost her, her reputation. She had no reputation. She was a bad woman. But because she believed, she received the grace of God, and she appears in the Savior's genealogy. Now, that shows you where you can go. Don't tell me that because you had a bad beginning, you have to stay there. 
We have a God of grace, and there are examples like Rahab through, sprinkled through the Bible to show you that no matter how bad you started, if you determine to walk the faith walk with Jesus, and you determine, and I'm not talking about this garbage stuff that's over the electronic church, I'm talking about the real walk with Jesus. If you determine to live for him and strike out for him, whatever's been in the past is past. And you don't have to live under that for the rest of your life. Rahab is a perfect example. She, by her believing God, and, and doing what she could, she saved herself and her whole household, and she earned a place in the Hall of Fame. And she's an example of grace throughout the ages and ages to come because God honored her and honored her faith. He still honors faith. And you know, the more that you learn about what's really going on in the world, in the religious world particularly, the more you understand the scripture that says, when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? My answer is not much. A lot that's masquerading as faith is foolishness and presumption. A lot of it's witchcraft. A lot of it's based on false premises and false presumptions. And it's not going to produce what people think it is. There are going to be people show up in heaven who built buildings and who conducted crusades and everything else from coast to coast. And when they get to heaven, they're going to be a pauper. They're going to have their salvation, and that's all. They're going to say, but where's all this... Uh, thousands of people that uh, accepted the Lord said, well, you did that for the glory of men. You got that. So you collected down on earth so you don't get anything here. Uh, you, uh, they said, but what about the big buildings, the institutions we built to, for the orphans and, and to help people and all the meals, the times we fed people and tons of food that we dispersed to the hungry people over in Africa and other places. And we worked and worked for hours and hours and he said, but you did that to be seen of men, and you were seen. You did that to make money and get applause when you walked on the platform. Everybody would stand and cheer because you were great. So you have your reward. It's, you, you used it up already. But there was nothing came up here. The results, God honored because it was based on his word. The person who worked their self to death on it gets nothing in heaven. You better go back. God looks at motivation and the why. And if your reason for doing something is to be recognized so that pastor and, and other people will think you're great and wonderful, okay, we may think you're great and wonderful, but that's it. If that's the reason you do it. Now, God's going to see to it that you get recognition for some of the things that you do down here. But it won't be, that's what you're after. That's not why you're doing it. You're doing it for his glory. That's the thing that's beautiful. That's where the reward comes from. This, uh, if you're a member of this congregation and you're praying and you, you think a lot of times, well, I'm not doing much. I'm not, nothing really is being accomplished by much of my life. I'm just a plain Joe or Jane and I'm just marching down and, she was, I'll never do anything spectacular. I probably won't fly across the country. I'll never be in a pulpit anywhere, never write a book or anything. But I do bind and loose, and I do pray for pastor, and I pray for the books, and I pray for the tapes, and I turn in my testimony, and they put it in there. Listen, when you get to heaven, you're going to be surprised. Oh, what a happy surprise. Some of you are going to come hug my neck and say, Pastor, I'm glad you were so hard and you just kept pushing us to do, 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 go ahead, go ahead, because I would have quit several times. And I thought, well, Pastor will be after me again if I don't buckle down. But you're going to see what I'm talking about. If you don't see it now, you'll see it then. You're not going to lose anything of your time, your money, or your prayer that you invest in this ministry. I'm convinced that you'll not lose a thing. You're going to gain eternal rewards for it. And as you've prayed, the books and tapes have gone all over the world. And this isn't Win Worley's accomplishment. If you could just remember, my name happens to be on the books and my name's up at the front of the, I'm the pastor and all this kind of stuff. But it would have never gone where it's gone had it not been for you dear people standing by the stuff and taking the pounding daily at your work at your home and everything else, if you hadn't just stood by the stuff and kept on praying, a lot of this would have never been done. Gotten some done. God will honor even one person being true to the Lord. But if you got 
a whole flock of people backing you up and praying for you, like I have. It makes it like dynamite. It makes it like an avalanche, an unstoppable thing. And this is the thing the demons scream about across the country. They can't stand me, but they have just about as nasty things to say about you as they do about me. I mean, they, they want to cut you loose from me. And if they can't do that, they want to drive you out of Hegwish. And you can go over there in the desert and graze with Frank over there with the lizards and the snakes and the, on the sagebrush and stuff. It's not very, uh, not very edifying, but it, it'll probably keep you going. But that's why, that's why so many people have been driven forth. And it's so sad because some of them, had they stood by the stuff, they would have been gaining rich rewards on everything. And now so many are out there and they're just they're giving out tracts. Hooray. But what are they doing? And They're not coming in actual grips with the enemy. All the training, all the understanding they had this is gathering cobwebs in the back of their mind. They don't use it. They wouldn't dare mention it where they are. I had a letter from Glenn. It's funny. It's on the book board. I want you to share it with you. <laughs> he said, this place not only doesn't have any deliverance around here, but said, you can't even talk about it. And said, you said, I can't even do self-deliverance. I can just see him. <laughs> said, they'd think I was weird and might send me off someplace. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Next time you get discouraged, just won't throw the whole thing overboard. Remember, we're working not just for time, but for eternity. And what we're doing is going to last. Not because we're great or good or smart or anything like that, but because God is great and God is good. And, and his truth bears fruit, even if we don't see it, until we get to heaven. Now, by the way, we're going to have a big... Um, we're going to have a big reunion in heaven one of these days for all the Hegwish folks that touch base with us. Won't that be great? And it's going to be a big bunch because you see everybody that touched here and God touched them and blessed them and they went on their way and then they reached out and touched others and then they reached out and touched others. Do you see how it multiplies? My, doesn't it make you anxious to get to heaven? But in the meanwhile, let's, let's chalk up some more. Let's get some more people headed that way, huh? like Ed was doing over at his house the other night. Praise God. Dear boy, uh, got more than he bargained for when he came in. But I bet he's happy today, don't you? Asking Jesus in his heart. Praise God. And you know, that's the way it ought to be. You ought not to have to run out and tackle him on the street and slam him up against the wall and say, Now will you trust Jesus? <laughs> Read this track on hell. That's where you're going if you don't receive it. And I'm not, we laugh, but you know, that's we, there's some folks not 100 miles from us that that's their tactics. When we first started, the uh, Lord started just churning over over in Tip of Chicago where we used to be located. Our kids used to go out loaded with tracks and stuff and witness in the parks and stuff and all that. And they'd go out and they'd come on the tracks with some other young people who'd been there. And the minute they said they were from Hagwish Baptist, these kids said, forget it. We just had some Baptists over here. And they said, well, what's the matter? Well, those people had talked to him about coming to church. And they wanted him to accept Jesus right now. And if they didn't, they're going to hell. And I'm kind of glad of it. Looks like you need it. And just that attitude. And that attitude comes through. And here our kids went forth filled with love and concern because they'd been snatched from a horrible pit and been delivered, filled with the Holy Spirit. And they said, oh, no, we, weren't, we didn't come to talk to you about going to church. We're going to talk to you about Jesus. They said, you do? And they said, yeah. And they'd sit down and get to talk to them about Jesus. Next thing you know, they lead several of them to the Lord. They said, where is that you said you went to church? I'd kind of like to go over there. I didn't like that other one. The way they approached, you see, they were, they're getting numbers on a roll. Uh, we, we really believe in rock and roll around here. We're on the rock and our name's on the roll. And I tell you, we, we believe in that strongly. We want everybody to have that blessing, don't you? But if you're, if you're walking with Jesus, that's when you're going to see the walls come down. And the walls of Jericho came down. Everything in it was cursed and destroyed. 
And they sent after Rahab and her family. The young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brethren, all that she had, brought out all her kindred, and left them without the, outside the camp of Israel. Took them out to safety on the outskirts of the camp of Israel so they wouldn't be bothered when all this slaughter was going on. That sounds kind of familiar, wasn't it? Rahab, her father, her mother, her brethren, all that she had, and all of her kindred. Seems like I remember a verse like that, Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Yeah. Joyce learned that when she first came to our church, didn't you? And, and she set out, she's a fanatic. Fanatics are bad enough, but red-headed fanatics are the worst kind, I think. You hear that, Jake? And uh, they... Uh, and she just kept on saying, it says, and my house, and I'm going to have every one of them before I get through. And that's a promise you can sit on. Amen. Don't you give up while they're living. If they're still wiggling a toe, keep claiming them. Unless you don't love them anymore and you just want to say, well, go on to hell then. I don't care. But as long as, you see, you love them better than anybody else does. If you're, if, you know, if they're family. And if you think they're really lost. You hang on to them unless God tells you to let them go. And uh, they may not like you now, but they'll love you for eternity if you hang in there and get them, get them across the line. I know it's not easy, but the rewards are unbelievable. There's a scripture that says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. Here we have, Blessed be the government who daily loadeth us with taxes. And new regulations. But there we have the Lord who blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. And these are things we didn't earn, we didn't deserve, and he just keeps on coming through. You can't lose people. Don't let the devil lie to you. He's got a big bunch of lies going around. Well, if you serve the Lord, you know, you just won't have nothing. Well, now that depends on what you want. You may not drive the shiniest new car. You may not have the biggest house. Uh, you may not have filet mignon. You may have hamburger more, uh, and you might you might have zucchini rather than some of the gourmet dishes. But uh, I'll tell you what, you'll have something that money can't buy. For instance, you could have peace in your heart. How about that? Listen, there's some people living in these big mansions. The rich and the famous. They run around and buy all kinds of houses, and they buy big pictures that don't look like nothing. And uh, you know, and <laughs> you can tell you can tell their minds affected because they like that stuff. <laughs> and I look at it and it makes my eyes run together. <laughs> I mean, to me, art that you have to try to figure out like a jigsaw puzzle. Forget it. I mean, don't tell me that's a woman. If it's a woman, it ought to look like one. It ought not to look like a bunch of yee hee here and there. And. Uh, but these so-called rich and famous people, they dine on dainties and delicacies. They get to eat snails and everything. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, they don't have peace. They get to go everywhere, but they may miss heaven altogether. That's the trip of trips. And I don't care where they go and what they have. I don't care how pretty they are in the mirror. I've noticed some of them, you know, uh, I didn't know these personally. My wife told me about them. Um, some of these older movie stars that are aging, you know. You know, the ladies, they now wear their dresses up here so you don't see the waddles underneath here. You know, like a turkey's got a waddle under his neck there. And... Uh, <laughs> And they wear long sleeve dresses because their arms are crepey, you know. And <laughs> and, uh, and that's all right. I mean, that's just growing old. But, but some of these gals, they still try to paint up like a teenager, you know. And do they ever look like idiots? Everything they do emphasizes this. And you see, they lived, they lived in a culture that was crazy over youth and beauty. Did you know that most other cultures in the world value the older people, because they figure they've got a little sense, they've learned a few things by knocking around. 
only in our culture have we gone crazy on youth and culture. People are just knocking. People are killing themselves trying to be young. And uh, some of them are just running and running and running, and they're doing this, that, and the other, trying to keep in shape. And I don't know what, for what. They're not going to heaven. And they, and they use all their time working and working and working and Miss Jane Communist Fonda and her workouts and, and uh, Miss Atheist herself and Farrah Fawcett Majors and her live-in boyfriend and all this kind of garbage. Well, see, that's all they've got. Isn't that, can't you see how shallow that is? Listen, you better build your hopes on things that last longer than that. Last a lot longer. And poor old Catherine Hepburn walking around doing like this all the time with Parkinson's so bad she can't hardly. And she's still saying she doesn't even know whether it's a God or not. I got news for her. She's going to find out. She's going to join Mr. Tracy, her live in boyfriend for many years. Neither one of them believed nothing. Oh, they made lots of money. And uh, they had everything went everywhere, but they're going to have the rest of it when they get there. That's so sad. And I know the world is pushing a trashy standard on you and everything, but God hadn't changed any. He hadn't moved from where he is. He's still in his glory. And those that will believe in Jesus and get with him are going to go home to be with him one day. And that's worth it all. It will be worth it all when we see his blessed face, when he calls us for his own. We'll have ten million happy years to sing of amazing grace. It will be worth it all when we get home. And there's an old uh, spiritual that I heard when I was down south, raised in the south. And the black churches used to sing it. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. And I want you to know there's a lot of that going on too, you know. And some of these folks, I don't know what they plan to do when they get to heaven. They don't like to go to church. They check in once or twice a year to see if it's still there. But that's about all. They just know church is there by rumor, maybe, if they go at all. I don't know what they do when they got there. They don't like to hear singing, oh, that old dreary singing. It'll be worth it all. I like something jivey, you know. Something up-tempo, you know. You think up-tempo. <laughs> Tell you what. It's good to be in the shelter of his arms, isn't it? And not have to worry and not have to fear. And that no matter whether kingdoms rise or fall, that God's still on his throne and Jesus is still standing by his people like he always has. And if some of them die in the the process, so what? That's not the worst thing can happen to you. Sometimes the worst have to live. Hmm? I know a lot of people that made such a mess that they'd like to die and get out of it. But they're having to live with it. Cain Cain was like that. When Cain uh, pulled his little dido, you know, then God came and told him what his punishment was. And he said, my punishment's greater than I can bear. He said, yeah, you've got to bear it in him. And he lived for years facing his misery. So, by the way, don't run out and think, well, I'm going to just do everything I want to and then I'll just die. God will kill me, not necessarily. And you can die slow, not fast. Just better hit the trail for Jesus, and then when it comes time to take you home, God will take you home, and that'll be then. Amen? Amen. Be like my Aunt Leela, who was lying up in bed laughing and talking to us an hour later. She'd gone to be with Jesus. She rested her work and was gone. She was still talking about something the Lord wanted her to do, though. But she'd shared it with a number of her prayer partners, and they're going to carry it on. It was to get the preachers together and pray for them that they go into deliverance.
Isn't that something? She was all excited. Said, I've got to, she kept telling my mother, said, when Wynn gets here, bring him up here. I've got to talk to him. I've got to talk to him. I've got to tell him what God's told me to do. She had shifted her praying. The Lord gave her a new prayer thing to pray for the preachers. She said, the poor preachers are not, they're not, they, we've got to pray for them. God will give them the strength and the leadership to go into deliverance and really dedicate themselves to the Lord. They've got to lead God's people into victory. And she'd already started. She'd already gotten several of them lined up. And uh, her pastor gave testimony. A lot of times when he was downhearted, he'd go over and spend two or three hours with her, and he came away refreshed. She's just a simple housewife. But her pastor found real blessing in going with her. And just, she had lots to tell him. Well, praise the Lord. If you want to invest your life in something, Invest in something that lasts. Don't waste it on something that's going to pass away. Don't waste all your time. You've got to make a living, sure. You've got certain things you've got to do. Now, some people, of course, get so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. They just float, float around about nine feet off the floor, you know, and everybody else is saying, well, come down to earth, you know. And uh, we've got a few things we've got to do down here, too, you know. But there's a, there's a way to hit the medium so you don't spend all your time. You do what you have to. But your main object is to serve the Lord. Well, verse 24, they burnt the city with fire and all that was in it. Only the silver, gold, vessels of brass and iron they put in the treasure of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelled in Israel even to this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy Jericho. Now she could have said, well, it's the law of the land. I'll have to turn these men in. But she recognized a higher law, that God had a higher law than any law of her land. And she hid the spies. I know there are people today who say, well, it's the law. You have to do it. If it conflicts with the higher law of God's word, forget it. Well, you can do it if you want to, but, you know, there's some of us are weird. We think that God's law comes first. In our country, the first law of the land is the Word of God. And right behind it is the Constitution. And those two standards have been completely pushed aside by about 99% of the people running the country. And the only hope we have is a restoration of the church that will sweep us back to constitutional government, which will put us back on Bible principles. And if we get back on Bible principles, a lot of the ills will be corrected. I don't know whether that can be done or not, but I, it's been undone, so why not see if it can be redone? God's a, he's a master at doing some of these things. And verse 26, And Joshua adjured them at this time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and build the city of Jericho. If he lay the foundation thereof, and his firstborn and his youngest son shall be in the gate, set up in the gates of it. And you'll find later on somebody did exactly this. They tried to rebuild Jericho and lost their firstborn. Joshua put a curse on it. And so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout the country. Yes, I imagine it did, uh, they said General Joshua and that army went, the walls of Jericho just fell down. You mean they didn't tear them down? No, they didn't. Can you imagine when the walls fell down, most of the soldiers were up on top of the wall? And the city was wide open and was utterly destroyed. And the enemy's fortress, their chief fortress in the land, was Jericho. And when the walls came down, it proved again that God was with his people that he didn't need anything except obedience from human beings. Did you know he's still that way? He still doesn't need anything from his people but obedience. To do the silly things he asks, like marching around the city. What a silly thing to do. But if God tells you to do it, it's not silly anymore. I praise the Lord. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, would you like to do it today? After all, things are getting serious you could face God before the end of this day if you, if you died today would you, would you be glad to see God you say well, 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 wait a minute I'm not quite ready well you better get ready could happen anytime 
And I'll tell you this, people who are lost and have many opportunities to receive Christ, almost 100% of the time they die suddenly and without remedy. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to be like the thief on the cross. And I tell them, which one? One of them went right straight on down to the fire and the other one got saved. I wouldn't want to wait till that last go around myself. You may not be the one that makes it. That gives you a 50-50 chance, and that's not very good for eternity, is it? If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, are you not sure? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure about it, wouldn't you like to do it today and make sure? We encourage you to do it. We urge you to do it. God wants you to do it. And if you will, you can get it straight today. If you can't straighten it out where you are, come down the aisle. There'll be fellows down here. Just tell them I need to talk to somebody about salvation. They'll get you somebody assigned. Sit down with the Word of God. Go over God's plan of salvation carefully and see if you're trusting in the things that will get you home to heaven. If you're not, you can change horses today. If you are, you can go away assured and sure of where you are and who you are. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, which is slowing down, stopping, and reversing spiritual growth and progress. You're talking about the work of demons, and what you need is deliverance from those things. And Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils. He never has rescinded that. It's still part of his things. He said, these signs will follow. first sign that follows believers is deliverance. And so if you need help in these areas, or you think you do, come down. And we'll get you a one-on-one person to pray for you right away. And you say, well, I've been down several times and nothing happened. Well, you still have the problem? Yeah, well, then come on, keep coming and you get some results. Don't give up. A lot of people stop just before they get help. Just keep coming until you get it. If it's, it's agitating you, keep agitating them. They'll come up. Eventually, they'll come up. And another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. If you've never received this gift, that's what it is. Just like your salvation, it's a gift. You can't work for it. You can't. Please God for it. You can't get it all. You can't crawl on your knees and walk in broken glass or anything like that and get it. But you can receive it as a gift if you want it. It's for you, just like salvation. And somebody here could help you to receive it if you to know about it and receive it if you haven't received it yet. And now then, another sign that follows believers: they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Jesus does heal by His stripes we're healed. And there are people here who believe that and could help you with physical needs by praying for them today. So if you have those, we encourage you to come and get prayer for it. Let's stand and sing something about that name. Come down the center aisle. If you're coming for prayer, make two lines. If you happen to be a first-timer coming for prayer, then cut the line and come straight down the middle to the front. Workers, if you'll make your way to the...